This evening, as I mentioned, we'll be hearing from Pony. Uh, Pony, for a number of years now, has uh, gained a bit of a profile on the resources community for uh, finding trash thrown TVs on the street or in bins in his neighborhood, taking them home and lovingly repairing them and doing them up and then giving them away to people that need them. Um, and so tonight, Tony will be talking to us about his experience of fixing 15 or is it 20 TVs now, Tony? I, I forgot. 15, okay. 15 whole TVs from the street, repairing them uh, or doing best to repair them and then giving them out. Uh, Tony will talk us through the most common issues that he sees with TVs found in the street uh, and how to deal with those particular problems. Um, and we'll then have a kind of a guided triage session between us based on what we've learned in the first half that Tony will lead us through to try and work out what's wrong with a particular TV he's got with him at the moment. Uh, and then will also be pressed time for questions and answers at the end of the session. Um, cool. Any questions before we get started? No? Okay, brilliant. Well, without further ado, uh, I'll hand over to Tony. Tony, take it away. Great. Thanks, James. Can everybody hear me okay? You can, you can nod at me and get a review. That's good. Um, well, and thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to, to do this uh, Skillshare. Um, and uh, I want to thank the Restarters organization and the community uh, of technical volunteers um, because it's been really helpful, you know, to be able to, to reach out to people when I've been trying to fix TVs and I've really benefited from a lot of the advice and insight from some obviously very clever electrical engineers who spend their time on, on, the, uh, on the forums. But to be really clear about two things, this is not a skill share which looks at component level repairs, right? There's nothing I'm going to be talking about today that presumes that you are an electrical engineer, really, so that you've just got a basic understanding um, about how electrical things work. And that I think leads me on to the second point, which is that we are talking about an electrical device, not a wind up toy. Um, and electricity is a dangerous thing, right? So in an electric crystal television, uh, we've got mains voltages, uh, which are dangerous enough. We've also got potentially very, very high voltages. Um, and th these voltages can, can kill you, basically. And if they don't kill you, it's going to hurt you a lot um, if you get shocked by those things. Most notably, the power supply. A lot of the television is just running on 12 volts or, you know, or lower than that. But, but the power supply is stepping down the mains voltage. Uh, and there are components on that that will remain charged with electricity for some considerable time, even after the TV is turned off. So do uh, take that seriously. And if you're not at all confident um, working with these things, don't take the back off the TV and start poking around with a screwdriver or a multimeter because you can do yourself a really bad injury. But the first point I want to make um, is that uh, most of the TVs that I've recovered, the majority of the TVs that I've recovered from the street or, um, you know, around kind of communal bin areas and so on, have, have simply been working TVs, right? So, and, and it continues to, to surprise me that, that, that that's the case, that people will dump um, working liquid crystal televisions with no faults at all, um, in the area close to where they live, possibly just perching it on the wall in front of their house or something. Um, and I suppose what's happening is that people are upgrading to a better television and then they wonder what to do with the old one. And rather than try and squeeze it into a wheelie bin, they conclude that sitting it next to the bin is the responsible thing to do. Um, so I pick them up. And I look at them and I bring them home and have a play with them. And most of the time they work just fine. And I give them away on a website called trashnothing.com, which many of you will be familiar with. It's a syndication site for things like Freegal and Lambda 3 Cycle and so on, which is the area where I live. Um, and I try to reunite them with people who are basically deserving, maybe not deserving, that's the wrong word, people that, that actually just genuinely need the television because <laughs> they don't have one. They're not trying to sell it on eBay or something like that to make a living. Uh, they just don't have the money to buy one, you know, and, and therefore they need, need a TV. 
So let's get started with the kinds of things that we need to check over when, when we see a TV, just to encourage you really to, to roll your sleeves up and get stuck in. Do you want to show us the first uh, slide, James? Just to say, we've only got nine slides here, so it's not going to be a death by PowerPoint um, experience. First thing we need to do, uh, and we are talking about liquid crystal TVs here, you know, the flat panel thin ones, not plasma, not OLED, which you're not going to find, of course, discarded at this time, and not cathode ray tube or the old fashioned kind of TVs. First thing we have to do is take a quick look at the TV. Does it have case integrity? Is it obviously smashed to pieces? What's the screen condition like? Um, maybe water has got into the TV, that could potentially be a problem. Um, is there maybe a captive lens cable? If the screen is obviously impact damaged, then we can still make some use of the set by recycling, uh, harvesting the spare parts and selling them on. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. Take the TV home if it looks basically okay, give it a bit of a dust down and a brush. Um, and really the, the thing that's uh, most useful in my experience is just a damp microfiber cloth. Um, to wipe the set down, uh, particularly the screen, and pay really close attention to the screen condition, because if the screen is damaged, um, there's generally not anything you can do to repair the TV, because the screen is really the largest component and the most costly component in the set. And it's the screen that most commonly gets damaged, and we'll come on to that in a moment. The obvious question is, how can we be sure? Well, I mean, if you look at the surface of the screen, that's usually a good indication, but it isn't guaranteed um, conclusive, right? Um, that's why I've written here, use a torch. Um, and the torch is helpful because you can see through the surface of the screen and look for impact damage. And I'll explain why that's important in a moment. If the TV has got wet, um, then leave it to dry out thoroughly. That could take several days. Clearly, water and electricity don't mix. And if you turn the television on when it's wet, it will just go kapow. Uh, and you'll do uh, a, lot, a lot of damage if you do that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we've got a little bit closer. Maybe the thing doesn't look like a write-off. Um, check over the mains cable insulation. Look at the plug wiring, the fuse rating. Very often they have 13 amp fuses for reasons that are not clear to me. It should be five amp, probably three amp. Um, you can check the continuity of these things if you have a multimeter. If it's not a captive um, a lead, maybe you need to substitute one. Um, you, you, know, you can buy them in any kind of electrical wholesale store, um, a known good lead. And then we can turn on the television. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> plug it in. Um, and that's not always as simple as it seems because when TVs are dumped, um, they often don't have a remote control. So you're looking at this fancy flat panel TV. There are no buttons on it anywhere. You're thinking, well, what can I do? There usually will be a button. So do push the button, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but that control panel might be faulty. And again, I'll come back to that in a moment. Try to use a remote control to turn the set on. And if you don't have the right remote control, which you almost certainly won't, um, then you can uh, get a universal remote control. I use a prank one for all, very, very commonly available, um, and just program that with the right code for the TV. Even if it doesn't support all of the TV functions, uh, pretty much any code for a Bush TV, for example, will work to the point that it will bring the TV out standby, right? So push the power button, turn it on with the uh, remote control. Next slide, James, please. Um, and then what happens next is the obvious question. Did the set power on? Um, well, modern TVs go through a power on cycle. Sometimes they make a noise, like a little chime. Um, sometimes not, uh, but you know, pretty soon it's gonna display a picture. Usually during that process, an LED will illuminate somewhere on the television. Uh, it might flash a few times, for example. Uh, it might even change color, but ultimately we're expecting to see a picture on the set. Um, if it didn't power on, well, were there any signs of life at all? Um, again, sound, any kind of picture, um, flashing LED as the system boots up. If the answer to that question is no, 
then most likely it's a power supply fault uh, and we can do some basic troubleshooting with the power supply um, in a TV. If there are some signs of life, maybe a, a flashing uh, power LED or a startup chime, maybe sound, but no picture, then you might have a faulty backlight in the TV and you can check for that situation with a bright torch. I'd like to be able to show you that, but in practice, it's very difficult because even very bright light won't penetrate very far into the liquid crystal um, uh, structure. But if you, if you look carefully and you scan the torch across the surface, often you'll see an image moving across the TV screen saying no signal, no input, something like that. Some kind of clue that the television is basically on, um, but it's just not um, illuminating, illuminating the screen. There are two types of backlights. The more modern ones are LED. The older ones are cathode ray tube, and the, the, the deeper the set, Generally, it's the cathode ray tube uh, backlight. Okay, so maybe the TV does come on and the screen display is okay. Um, everything appears to be fine. Leave it for a while. Um, see if it uh, has any faults that might be related to just getting warmer. Uh, sometimes that happens. Um, maybe the TV might spontaneously turn itself off or restart or something. So just basically watch the TV. We can all do that, can't we? So sit back tune into your favorite program um, if there is uh, a picture but there's some kind of strange pattern on the on the screen maybe color bars distortion or obvious blunt force trauma impact and i think the fate awaiting most tvs at least those in the bedrooms of children or homes of children is um, a football yeah. i've seen quite a few sets with a notable round impact uh, and then a completely shattered effect um, mm. catastrophic impact damage you can't repair that um, but some of the other faults the kind of weird patterns and um, uh, you might be able to uh, might be able to replace uh, a board in the set possibly the main board or something called a TCOM board um, but those faults are a little bit more difficult to, to diagnose and um, you can find useful advice and examples of the sorts of patterns and problems that you might see on uh, YouTube, in my experience. So those are the main steps. And um, we're going to take a look inside a set in a moment. James, do you want to show us the next slide? And this is my personal experience um so that that looks fine doesn't it right now obviously it's not a high resolution photo but this is a set that i recovered and um i very carefully checked it over and i thought well the screen looks absolutely fine but the tv is completely dead so what i did in my um, naivety was source a uh, secondhand power supply i fitted the power supply in the tv and excitedly reassembled it all and turned it back on only to see this next image confront me which was a bit disappointing obviously so um, that's why the tv was was thrown out and in this particular case i think it, it was the uh, impact damage that that destroyed the power supply as well so i repaired one thing but couldn't repair the screen and um, you know therefore I just took the power supply back out and sold it on and the TV was uh, was recycled so do check the screen to make sure it's damaged before you spend any money or try to source those spare parts can we move on to the next next slide James thanks okay um so we got to the stage where we think we might need to do some work on the internal component in the set. Just reiterating the first point that mains electricity can kill you. Um, in particular, when we take a look at the power supply inside the set, here's one I prepared earlier, <laughs> Blue Peter style. Um, this has been out of a TV for a really, really long time, but I'm still not gonna touch the, the important components. These are the capacitors on the end here, they store electricity. And um, those are in particular 
uh, I'm going to give you a very nasty shock, um, possibly. So we want to be really careful about, about stuff like that. I'm going to protect the screen because um, if you damage the screen, you're going to write the TV off um, and you want to make sure you order the right parts. The circuit boards invariably have a sticker with an impossibly small, difficult to read number or series of numbers. It can be hard to find the number that you need, but the websites that sell the parts will give you some guidance on that. Try and find the service manual. Again, I've got a link later on um, that will help you do so. And the service manuals are great because they have uh, flow charts that explain what to check and where to check it. Um, but uh, yeah, more generally, if we're just taking the back off the TV, that's not a particularly hard thing to do. Um, and my advice is that uh, uh, as you dismantle the TV, you should take photos and you should be very careful to store the screws in a compartmentalized container because one, you'll lose them, particularly if you have a carpeted floor like I do here. And two, they're often different sizes and you certainly don't want to be putting a very long screw into a hole that's designed for a short screw, because as you screw it through, you can damage a component on the other side. When you look at the circuit boards, you'll see that the cable and connector pairs are typically very dissimilar. Um, so not easy to kind of confuse them and plug them in the wrong place, but oftentimes they're very delicate. So you have to be careful when you remove uh, the connectors to remove a circuit board and of course you also have to be careful not to electrocute yourself in the process so do make sure that you disconnect the tv from the mains and put the mains put the cover back on the tv before you turn the power back on when you've done the repair show us the next slide james let's take a quick look at what we find inside a typical tv now this is a, a photo of um, the insides of a samsung TV that I've repaired some time ago and I'm actually in the process of trying to find a new owner for at the moment. Um, two parts I've highlighted there. On the left-hand side, we see the power supply and on the right-hand side, the main board, sometimes called the logic board. Um, and in the middle, there's a speaker, interestingly, on, on, on this set. A um, couple of things to point out. In the bottom left-hand corner of the power supply, there's what's called a C8 connector, and that's a two-pin figure of eight connector for the mains power cable. So if there's any doubt in your mind, um, where the mains power cable goes is the power supply board. And we have uh, a cable at the top of the power supply running in to um, you know, the top of the TV. That's the backlight feed and um, on the right hand side we can see um, another cable that runs across to the main board so that's carrying low voltage uh, 12 volts typically 5 volts 3 volts um, to power the, the main board and there are other components but you know these are the two main ones that I want to, to focus on here removing the power supply is not especially difficult you can see there's a number of connectors uh, it's screwed on um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really, not, uh, really not difficult to do, but do, do be mindful um, about the risk of electric shock, in particular from, from, those, um, from those capacitors. Uh, likewise with the main board, not hard to remove, can be a bit fiddly. All of the connectors that you see on the outside of the TV are, are on the edge normally. You can see here on the bottom and the right hand side, that's where you find the HDMI cables and so on. So they can be a little bit, a little bit fiddly. Um, okay, show us the next slide, James. Um, let's move on. So with all of that done, um, the obvious question is, can we apply it to a actually faulty TV? <laughs> and um, I do have a faulty TV here in my living room. So I'm going to ask you guys to unmute. Anybody wants to have a go at joining in here or asking any questions about what we've uh, looked at so far. And we're going to try to diagnose the problem in the TV um, that I have here. So you can stop showing the slides for now, James. Um, and I'll invite our team of um, engineers to contribute to this particular, <laughs> this particular exercise. Um, I'm gonna move over to where the TV is. So just give me a moment to do that.
at, now I don't have a broadcast quality camera in my living room. Um, all I've got is my little um, my little tablet. So might need a little bit of fiddling around to get this right. Just bear with me. There's a TV. I'm still here. Look. <clears throat> um, so there it is on my living room table. And if we look real close, can you see? Uh, is there a little red light? Can anybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it in the corner there? Right. Yeah. I'll just point. So the TV is powered on, and you're just going to have to take my word for it that there doesn't appear to be any obvious damage to the panel on the set. So this does look like a candidate for trying to make TV work. I've plugged it into the mains, got the captive cable here just running down to the main socket. And as soon as I turn the mains on, the red light comes on. So that looks encouraging, doesn't it? Right? Um, now, like most modern sets, this is actually quite a fancy um, ultra high definition thing from Bush, not very expensive. Um, there's no obvious power button. There is a control panel around the side, but fortunately, <laughs> I've got a remote control, which I've programmed with the code for the Bush TV. Does somebody have a question? Laura? Yes, fact, thank you. Uh, um, uh, how do you check? Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Um, how do you check if there's water inside the television? I mean, you just well, check it out, but how, or humidity, it could be humid as well. Yeah, you're it? right. You're right. That, that is a good question. Well, what you tend to find, I mean, obviously, most of the TVs that I've recovered, <coughs> they've, they've just been on the street near where I live, right? So, so I know if it's been raining recently, you know, and you walk around the corner and there it is sitting on the side of the road, yeah. and it's basically wet. It's just wet. Right? Yeah. Or you might see... Uh, what looks like dust from raindrops, you know, or there might be water on yeah. the back of the set or something. So what you can do is, if you want to be sure, is just take the back off with it when, it, when it's not plugged in and just make really, really sure that it's dry, basically. Or alternately, just leave it for a few days, right? Because any any water there mm. is going to evaporate. What can sometimes happen is the can you use as well? Yeah. Carry on. Sorry, can, can you use as well uh, the, this? Uh desiccants or the humidifiers you know this oh, little sachets yeah, that they yeah, put in, the, yeah. in food and yeah potentially you could do that i mean the trick with things mm. like mobile phones is to drop them into a bag of rice isn't it because the, the rice is dry and it just yeah yeah yeah, yeah correct i wouldn't yeah. do that with a tv um <laughs> i think what, what can sometimes that's happen a big is sag of that, rice yeah <laughs> that's a, it would be a lot of rice wouldn't it yeah uh, what can sometimes happen is the water <laughs> can get into the backlight area and it can stain the backlight, right? Which is annoying because you have to completely dismantle the TV to get to the, it's like a white reflector, basically, that reflects the light through the TV. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it can be a problem, but it will always dry out given time. And then you can begin, you know, the repair process. So just, just be cautious on, on that point. Yeah. Did somebody else have a hand up? Yeah, thank Alan, you. I think you might have. You might have had you in that phone. Okay. Well, look, so um, I'm going to turn the TV on. Are we ready, everybody? <laughs> Here we go. So yes. push the <laughs> remote control. LED light is starting to flash. And will you believe it? Now, if <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Yeah. So this is not what we're supposed to happen. <laughs> Uh, because it's going to come on, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> might have touched it, right, Tony. <laughs> oh, damn it. So, oh, no, yes, no, no, it is. It's actually working. Yes, yeah. that something. I actually, yeah. what I was hoping, obviously, uh, was that it wasn't going to come on. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm going to improvise my way out. Of this because this your is magic hands was, yeah wow. yeah this is a tv that, that was dumped near me and i think the reason why it was dumped is that it's unreliable right so what happens is you can hang it on your wall and it will work fine for a few days and then you'll turn it on in the evening and it doesn't come on <laughs> and you think what's the matter with it so you know i took it i took it down took it put it to one side oh, yeah. and I've put it on my table here and I've turned it on 
and much to my surprise it's actually come on <laughs> so what i'll do instead is explain how to check now can you see at the top it's got this thing that says no channels have been added yet please go to the installation mm. menu to add channels now if the backlight on the set hadn't come on you wouldn't be able to see that right but nor would there be an led on the front here okay so what's actually happened is the tv has gone through its power on process but there's no backlight and therefore there's no image does that make sense and the only way you can see the image is if you take a really bright torch so i've got an led headlight turn it on and put it really close to the screen and then you can just about see it says no channels have been added yet you know or you might see an image moving around or you might see a netflix logo or something you can see that the image is there. Now, obviously, if it's the, if it's tuned into the regular television, you might hear somebody speaking, you know, because it's a TV program that it's, that it's tuned into. So this TV has got a problem with the backlight. That's the problem. Right? It goes through the power on cycle. Sometimes the backlight comes on, uh, as it has today, rather awkwardly, um, but usually the backlight doesn't come on right and i've got a live case actually open on the uh, restarters website at the moment asking people for advice there is a service manual for this particular set with uh, a series of steps that you can follow and components that you can check and i've yet to find the time to do that if i'm honest um, but i will will get around to it um laura you've got your hand up <clears throat> Sorry, yeah. If uh, if the vision of the of the screen is erratic, could it be as well a connection, a loose connection, or a cable which is damaged? Well, I, I think a possibility. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I have already taken this apart on one occasion. It's a perfectly reasonable okay. presumption to make on your part. Um, it's an LED uh, lighting system. So there's a number of bars. That, uh, they're like uh, you know metal bars that have LEDs periodically placed in series. Um, and, um, you know, you can get a device for testing the LEDs, but the simple truth is it's either an on or an off thing, right? <laughs> so they either work or they don't work. Indeed. <laughs> Clearly they are working, right? So therefore, I think it points to the logic Brilliant. in the power supply, which is actually quite sophisticated in these kind of modern switch mode power mm. supply. I'm going to go and sit down now and turn this off because it's wasting electricity, right? <clears throat> There we go. So anybody really wants a, an unreliable Bush TV, I'm your man. Yeah. All right. So that wasn't quite what was supposed to happen. Um, so we just looked at some really simple troubleshooting steps, right? And I just want to emphasize that most of the time, the problems are really simple. James, do you want to take us on to the, to the last couple of slides and then we've got time for some, for some questions and general discussion. Okay, um, so some other possibilities then. A lot of the TVs that I've found are really, really old and they don't decode a modern digital video um, broadcast, a DVB um, broadcast. And, um, I've long since used uh, Chromecast myself because I don't actually have a, a TV feed here in the flat. Um, so that's mainly how I watch TV. Uh, but there are lots of devices that we could use. Amazon Fire Stick, Roku. Um, the older uh, Freeview decoders are almost, well, they're certainly very cheap. I mean, I actually got one from, from Freecycle, um, for, for Trash Nothing for a TV and I wanted um, to repurpose. And all of these devices, um, plug them into a HDMI socket on the TV, and you've basically created a smart TV. So again, we don't need to throw that old set into a landfill, um, possibly even use a TV with a games console, one of the sets that I gave away recently. Um, the guy was, was thrilled to give a TV to his children <laughs> so they could play with their playstation and stop bothering mum and dad um who wanted to watch the tv obviously peter do you have a question yeah um yeah thanks tony could you use it as a second screen for a, 
uh, a PC or a laptop? That's a good question, or? yeah. So a lot, a lot of TVs do have, um, what's it called, a D-sub, isn't it? It's a 15-pin VGA connector on the back. And they can be quite good as, as uh, computer monitors. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And they're huge, obviously. <laughs> so they're a bit like, whoa, if you're trying to work on it. But potentially, yes, you could use one. And obviously, you get smaller TVs. So a lot of the TVs yeah. that I've recovered have been 19-inch, sort of 20-inch. Uh, and um, they, they do work perfectly as monitors. Yeah, so you could, you could certainly do that as well. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so um, another, uh, another alternative to throwing the thing in the bin. Key points in summary, then. Most of the discarded TVs that I found work absolutely fine. Um, even if they don't work, then um, you can often swap a part. Um, and if the screen's damaged, you can harvest the parts and somebody else can reuse them. Um, I've sold quite a few parts on eBay. And what I do is um, gift the proceeds of the sale to the Restarters charity, which has... Um, uh, you know, you can you can do that kind of gifting process on, on eBay quite straightforwardly when you list things. Just to re-emphasize, maze electricity can kill you. Um, so if you're not confident, don't take the back cover off in the first place. Um, always make sure you disconnect the TV from the mains before you start dismantling it and be especially careful not to touch capacitors and the components, particularly on the uh, mains power supply. Um, when you're uh, dismantling the set, even hours, days after it's been, been disconnected. You don't need thousands of pounds worth of tools. Um, damp microfiber cloth, as I say, bright torch. I've got uh, an old head torch here that I use. Uh, really very uh, effective for um, uh, there it is. Uh, examining the TV. Universal remote control, I think, is essential because you're never going to get um, a remote with the set. Just a few basic screwdrivers. And for the ambitious, uh, a multimeter, again, doesn't have to be very sophisticated. You just need to be able to check for continuity. Also helpful if you can measure voltages, including mains voltages. There's a link there for service manuals. Sometimes you can find them on the manufacturer's website. Um, spare parts, eBay is a great source for spare parts because, again, people are harvesting TV components. And EMOS, I found to be a very helpful supplier. They even go as far as helping uh, you identify where to find the part number on specific boards for specific models of TV, right? So you can be really sure that you're getting the right part. And that's our mantra, folks, isn't it? Uh, reduce, keep using the thing, uh, repair it if it goes wrong, reuse it. If it can't be a TV anymore, do something else with it. And if the TV really is busted because somebody's kicked a football into it, then um, you can recycle those components. And uh, as I say, my experience with really very little effort over a number of years, I've saved quite a few TVs from landfill. People who really needed uh, a TV and didn't have uh, the money to buy one have benefited from, from that work. And I don't know how many um, uh, kilos of carbon dioxide it saved, but it's quite a lot. And it's a lot of nasty stuff that hasn't gone into a landfill somewhere or been dismantled by children in a country far away for no money, uh, poisoned. Um, so I hope you found that useful. I hope uh, that uh, when you see these things near you, or maybe um, if you want to get involved helping somebody that's, that's got a problem, you'll feel emboldened to, to have a go. Um, and uh, I hope that if you're more experienced than me, you'll help me out. <laughs> you'll help me fix this bush. Yeah. It's working already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it won't be for long. I'll turn really? it on again. <laughs> <That's probably not. laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, um, James. Oh, try and lower my hand if I can click on it. Oh, well, look, there we are. Right. Um, yes, yeah, interesting you um, give reference to manualslib.com because every time you look for a manual, and I've looked for, for boilers and things, that always comes up. I'm always very wary about clicking on that because I thought it was a bit of a spam type thing, but you, you, you've used it and you think it's okay. Yeah. 
just to be clear, what I normally do is search for the the detailed kind of technical model number of the TV. It's, it's no good just searching for Samsung liquid crystal TV. Obviously, that isn't going to get you anywhere. But if you just um, use your favorite internet search engine, I use DuckDuckGo because, you know, Google will bubble you. Obviously, that's always a problem. Um, uh, and oftentimes it will it will take you to that that particular website. Um, uh, sometimes you can find one on the manufacturer's website, um, but certainly I've I've had good results with with them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask a question? Sorry. Laura, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm, I may be a bit confused because the last time I opened the television, it was one of these cathode tubes you know just 30 oh, yeah, years yeah, ago yeah. <laughs> they were fantastic yeah, yeah. very obvious and uh, so um and computers uh how about anti-static anti-static electricity good question Do you yeah. have to so look that as well with the modern tvs yeah, oh, yeah. so i think <laughs> i think the answer to well the answer to that is potentially yes um when you look at uh certainly smart tvs like this this bush one by the way this bush is largely an empty box right and and if you're having difficulty um trying to find the parts for these really cheap tvs like bush and alba they're actually based on components from a company called vestel v-e-s-t-e-l so um that can be the place to go to to find the manuals but to answer your question Nora, um the smart TVs will often have, you know, they're basically a computer, right? So they've got RAM and RAM is static sensitive. Um, so I think the answer is yes, you need to be careful. Yeah, you, you want to be drain, you know, putting on your anti-static strap and plugging it in and yeah. making or sure that you're not... Yeah. yeah, yeah, use a mat. Um, or touch, sure you can be you're... touching as well the table, can you? You touch, you touch well, good well, one with the other hand. Be, it needs to be something that's earthed. So um, generally speaking, I mean, it can help if you touch something that's metal, yeah, for sure. But when you look at computer engineers doing it, they use a conductive mat, don't they? They plug that into the mind, not into the mind. So rubber, rubber shoes as well, isn't it? It's an earth connector, isn't it? And then they put a rubber, they put a, a bungee cable on and they put it on their wrist and attach that to the mat. So you know, you're draining away all the static electricity. Um, so yes, you're right. But the older sets, not so much. You know, mm. my understanding is that it's it's really a, a few semiconductor components um, that are static sensitive. Okay. Yeah. And in any case, uh, does the el uh, electricity build up? I mean, if the comp if the TV has been outside for several days, unless it has been working, it wouldn't have any electricity on it, wouldn't it? So well, that's scratch, right. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. So capacitors do discharge over time. Um, there'll be somebody here that's more knowledgeable than me about that, I'm sure. Um, but they do discharge over time, definitely. Uh, and therefore it gets you know progressively safer <laughs> to work on you can discharge the capacitors yourself that's a risky thing to do obviously and um, you can buy a device that will do it safely which is important when you're working with uh, switch mode power supplies because they have um, uh, lots of other kind of logic and components on them and if you just brutally kind of discharge the the electricity you can actually damage the power supply in in the process even if it's working in the first instance um the other thing i'll say is that it, it's quite common to get people in the restarters community asking you to post photos of the board and they want to look at the capacitors and so on and they'll say oh it's that one there that needs to be changed well this isn't very straightforward to do frankly you need the soldering gun and you know all that kind of stuff and and, um, and again, it's risky because they might have a charge and blah, blah, blah. I've never actually done that myself, I'll be honest with you. I've always just said, look, if you think it's the power supply, I'm going to buy another one for a fiver, basically, from eBay, and I'm going to try it. <laughs> if it works, then I'm going to... I'm Nothing going to put, <laughs> I'm going to put this in my pile of broken electronics, and one day I'm going to take you all round to the council's wee sort of recycling point and say, look, can you please recycle all of this stuff now a lot of people i know will probably um write hate mail to me now as a consequence of that but but i don't have the skills you know to 
to do those kinds of repairs and it's it's just risky and and the more modern stuff i mean you take a sony tv apart it's a work of art really the very elegant very sophisticated design and they've got almost no discrete components at all so they're just tiny tiny little resistors and capacitors and you can barely see them you know you almost need a microscope to try to to work on the thing and quite how you you know desolder them they're not made to be repaired right i mean yeah. this was made to be repaired <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah. in obsolence they are built yeah, in this obsolence is, yeah, this is, uh, the best yeah. is there built any by robots as well so that's why you can't yeah, yeah. Well, the cars absolutely. Yeah. By yeah, yeah. Isn't there a new law that uh, that imposes that every single new electronic has to be not be made in obsolence? So they have to be the right to repair. I think it was. Well, there's a discussion about that now, and I think other oh, people sorry. on the call sorry. today will be well. Other people on the call today will be more knowledgeable than me about that. Uh, but my understanding is that the European Parliament. Has mm. passed some kind of measure. The Council of Ministers need to talk about implementing it. There's a big round of consultation with all the manufacturers, yeah. you know, and they'll all try to resist to varying degrees, obviously. But at least in principle, I think there is agreement, and um, there'll be rules that say they have to make parts available for like 10 years and. Um, potentially people should be able to, uh, to to fix things themselves, you know, get hold of the manuals and stuff. So that's, that's a good thing, definitely, but not straightforward. With, I know. With like a TV. <laughs> Probably a little it, bit easier with a TV than, a, than an iPhone yeah. 12. Um, you know, because <laughs> at least it's there, a physical actually. thing where you can take it apart. Kind of yeah, it used to be a lot easier, wasn't it? Just to put things apart and see all the parts and put them together. Now it's just, as you say, a work of art, untouchable. Yeah. Very confusing. Thing, I didn't. I didn't stray into the kind of faults that you get with liquid crystal panels. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube about that. They're yeah. impossible to repair. I mean, <laughs> you, know, you just can't repair them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but diagnosing them is a challenge. And the last kind of step in the chain is a very, very, very delicate flat ribbon cables that plug into the kind of edge of the liquid crystal panel. The yeah. connectors are really fiddly and delicate, and it's just absolutely nerve-wracking you know working yeah. on that stuff and it's so easy to damage it and make it worse if you don't know what you're doing but most of the problems that i've come across have been 40 power supplies i've had a couple of tvs with a 40 main board and um i tried a teak on board swap on one set that didn't fix it once it was sony um there have been a couple of liquid crystal panel faults ultimately which have not been repairable And um, the rest of them have been catastrophic panel damage, you know, where someone's kicked the football into it, basically. Yeah. And that's it, game over. Is it worth <laughs> so, it buying a, a screen? No, no, never. Yeah. Because they're always... Is it, very, is it worth very... it repairing the screen? No, no because they, they just cost <laughs> so, so what happens is the screen gets damaged and people take all the other components out and then recycle mm. the rest. Because you can't repair them The manufacturing yield of liquid crystal screens is actually quite low. So when people think these, you know, these mm. TVs are some kind of environmental miracle, the reality is they're not, because a lot of the panels that get made just get just get thrown away and and because they've got faults, you know, yeah. in the manufacturing stage. So no, yeah. there, there's there's just nothing you can do. I Thank mean, you. It's a new screen, and then it's it's a write-off. Yeah. Yeah. So to come in very briefly on uh, that right to repair point, Laura, um, I think for TV, the most pertinent thing to know at the moment is that the EU did pass some legislation a couple of years ago uh, that pertains to TVs, um, and it mandates a few things, including that spare parts have to be made available for 10 years, for example, for TVs and a few other categories of consumer products. Mm. Um, Yeah, it's great, obviously, it's a good start, but the law itself is quite limited. I'll post a link in the chat to a, kind of a brief article that summarizes that in a bit more detail. And I'm, it applies in the UK as well. The UK uh, right. enacted that legislation in the UK law uh, last year, I believe. I'll mention a couple, of, and that's really helpful, James, and that's a very positive step forward, isn't it? And I think one of the great things about Restart is as a campaigning charity is that all of that work is, is ongoing, you know, and there's a lot of pressure that's applied. Um, but at the same time, 
there's a practical edge to what what the charity does and you know organizers like james do a lot of good work in um in getting people involved in repair work i've been along to a few restart parties i think they're called or events you know prior to covid lockdown and they were always tremendous fun you know and i look forward to to going back um, to, to those in, in future. People don't typically bring TVs to them, I would say. <laughs> it's more, mostly laptops and phones and tablets and just other really, toasters. Everybody hates toasters, don't they? Um, they're always going wrong. So um, a couple of other quick points. Sometimes TVs, I didn't put this on the slides, sometimes they get discarded because of something really very simple. I was embarrassed to have one a little while ago um, which had a non-responsive control panel and it turned out the child lock was turned on you know and it's the kind of thing you can only get at with remote control when you get into the menus and sort of play around with it so that was really embarrassing and I had another one but when you turned it on the screen just went red green blue red green blue and it just kept cycling through the primary colors over and over and over and i thought this is really weird and it turned out <clears throat> that it was just stuck in an engineering test mode so simply using a remote control i programmed the remote control <clears throat> as soon as you push the menu button the tv just came on <laughs> so somehow it got stuck in this engineering mode and you could just imagine probably a child sat on the remote control and pushed the exact combination you know to trigger the engineering mode so don't discount the simple stuff and the weird things because i've wasted quite a lot of my time messing around changing components because i've overlooked something very simple put the thing you know there's often got like a factory reset and just go reset it to its factory settings you know and that can help. They, someone's turned the brightness and the contrast all the way down. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't look like it. there's a picture, you know, or there's no area or something. So all, all those kinds of simple things, do, do check them first. Um, I had a set where I, I actually went as far as changing the power supply and the main board, I faffed around with it. And, you know, had people on the restarters communicating, oh, it must be this component. Wasted days and days and days, and it turned out that it was the control panel that was faulty, right? So you could push the on button as much as you like. It would never come on. But if you used the, the remote control, bing, <laughs> it just came on straight away. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. Danny, what about faults with remote controls? I'm sorry? What about faults with remote controls? The actual handheld oh. bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess you're right. So you, you could have a problem with the remote control equally, couldn't you? Um, so there's, there is a, there's a sensor on the set that, that you know, that looks for those signals. Um, but the remote itself might be faulty. I mean, I've been using this uh, programmable one, you know, so um, it doesn't really get, get a lot of use. Uh, but yeah, certainly... The light, the light in the remote control, yeah. yeah the light could, in the remote control as well, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it could be, could be a problem with the remote. Yeah, perhaps. I had one where just a couple of the buttons just stopped working, like the volume yeah. control or the program changer, and um, we had a Virgin um, cable, and they just provide a brand new remote control for your charge. I've still got the old one, but not played around with it yet. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> certainly all, always check those those simple things. So if you've got alternatives. Um, use a different remote what i usually do is I, I find the kind of cheap ones that you can buy on ebay for a fiver you know when i when i give the sets away so i can just say to people look at, you know there's the remote um and um you know just it'll work fine it's not not the original one but but it'll work fine the last point is stands are often missing um so two things about that really you could obviously get the manufacturer's stand they're very expensive typically uh, eBay and other companies will um, sell stands that are designed to bolt onto the four holes on the back of the TV. And they can be quite quite elegant looking things. They're usually very cheap. Um, and that way you can find another stand for the TV. Because obviously it's not practical just to have the thing leaning up against the wall. And mounting them on a wall isn't entirely straightforward. You need to buy a bracket and 
drill the wall and all the rest of it. So um, mm. I think um, on a couple of occasions, mm. I've bought cheap stands, you know, just so that people can have them sitting in their living room on a table. Um, so that's that's something to think about. There we are. Um, so, yeah, that's Thank pretty you. much all I've got to say about fixing TVs, folks, really. Has anybody got any other questions or observations, any war stories that they want to, to share? <laughs> a lot of this applies to computer monitors, of course, as well, because computer monitors, if anything, are quite a bit simpler than TVs, um, and they are based on the same functional electronics, same kinds of screens and, and so on. So a few of the 15 that I referred to earlier were actually computer monitors. Mm. So how much can you dismantle a TV and how can you make sure that when you are selling them on eBay, those are working? Because it's a bit touch and go, isn't it? Um, sorry, can you just repeat the question? Sorry, but yes. Uh, how do you how do you know if you have a, if you have a, a TV and you are just putting the the parts aside to sell mm. them? How can you make mm. sure that the parts you are selling are are working, are functional? That's a, well, again, that's a good question. It's 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 a logical inference, really. So, I mean, if you go back to the slide that I showed you earlier with the Toshiba uh, Regza TV, you know. Um, uh, once the screen comes on, right, even if it's got catastrophic panel damage and you can see it's been punched or something like that, what you usually see is the BBC, whether a man or woman behind, you know, and it, it, in reality, the TV is working fine. You can change the channel, you can bring up the menus, okay, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. hear the sound, right? And actually, it's all fine. It's just the screen that's ruined, right? So that's good enough to say the power supply is okay, the main board's okay, oh, okay. speakers are okay, etc. and then you can dismantle it. Obviously, if the thing's completely dead, then you've got a problem, haven't you? You can't know if the main board's okay and so on. And it would be a bit dishonest, I think, to, to list the set yeah, that's what I mean. as working. <laughs> what you could say, what you could say, you could honestly describe it and say, you know, there's, there's no sign of life at all, the panel's damaged, etc. So I am giving this away for spares or parts. And somebody with a bit more time and a bit less money might want to just, they've got the exact model that's faulty, they might want to try a few kind of speculative transplants, you know, to see if they get the set working that way. Um, but you're right, you, you do need to think about that quite carefully. Yeah. You don't want to mislead mm. people, particularly you. if you're selling things on eBay because you'll get bad feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the thing is as well, if we repair something, then uh, if they do the PAT test, can it pass it? I mean, if we have fixed it properly, because for instance, putting a, I've got a toaster, I, I burnt the whole of the cable. Even if I change that, that is not going to pass any PAT, isn't it? The test. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned PAT test. I'll be honest with you, I'm not 100% sure what a PAT test is. I don't have a PAT tester. <clears throat> My understanding is that restart events, um, there's usually somebody with a PAT tester who will want to do a test if, um, you know, maybe your toast has been repaired and someone wants to take it away. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a device that tests a variety of electrical properties of the device yeah. to make sure it's not earthed or it is earthed, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I've, I don't have one. I've never used one. But what I can say is that any TV that leaves here doesn't have live sparking wires poking out the back. <laughs> the insulation is fine on the cable. The TV, no need to test it. Work, you know, it works, doesn't it? Fundamentally, yeah. it's got the right fuse yeah. in it. No, I would, uh, yeah. No, I was just wondering, you know, if you sell something that you have repaired yourself on eBay, for instance, then if anything happens, if anyone has got an accident, you are liable for it. So well, I I, that's, that's I, an interesting question. I've not, not really thought about the, um, I mean, what I'm doing, of course, is giving people things. You know, I'm using a website mm -hmm. called Crash Nothing, you know, and I'm, I'm very honest with people. I'm saying, look, I found this TV uh, close to where I live. I've tested it. It seems to work okay. Yeah, if you want TV, oh, I'm, so. I'm sure the, the website itself will, will have a disclaimer anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's up to you what you do with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, I think we're actually coming to 
the end of our time here. Um, any last minute burning questions for Tony before we call it a night? No? Tony, if it helps, uh, I just did some back of the napkin calculations and uh, worked out that for 15 BVs, give or take, um, you've potentially saved around four metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Well done. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's quite a lot of yeah. carbon dioxide, isn't it? And that's it's called embodied CO2, isn't it? And I know TVs are quite high up there. Maybe not as bad as laptops, but they're, mm. they're pretty bad. On. Mm. Pretty yeah. high, yeah. Yeah. And everyone is getting rid of them as well. So there's going to be a lot of things in the streets, unfortunately. 100%. Sorry, I think there was a question. Peter, I think, was asking. No, no, no. no. I'll scratch my ear, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, me too. Great. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I hope this has been informative. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. And a huge thank you to Tony for sharing your yeah, experience and your knowledge with us this evening. Um, I, I certainly learned a huge amount. So that was really, really helpful, really enjoyable. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, thanks thank so much. you, James, as well. Thank you. Very kind. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy repairing. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.